When I wrote about it, in addition to assuming that all Asia tech companies, particularly in China, were copycats of Western companies, I think there are also a lot of misperceptions about how easy it is to enter a market, especially when they're an Asian market, especially when there are incumbent players already. Uber failed. Basically, they failed. That's a harsh word, but they failed in both China and Southeast Asia, where they were acquired by DD in China and Grab in Southeast Asia. And then Facebook really fell flat on its face in a lot of markets with free basics. You know, it undermined net neutrality and also assumed that consumers, just because maybe they had to be price conscious, they were willing to access only a handful of sites as opposed to having access to a free internet. I think people also underestimate the influence that Asia has had in other parts of the world. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leung, and the best way to think about Asia's future is to reflect on its past. What better way to do this than with Catherine Shu, a former writer with TechCrunch, covering Asia tech for the past 12 years. Catherine, welcome to the show, and you're one of my first guests on this show many oh, really? years back. Really? I had yes, no idea. That was back in... 2014? 2015 or 2015, yeah. Yeah. And you were my 14th guest. Sorry, my episode 14. Yes. I actually went back and checked recently. Yeah. So the interesting thing is I wanted to get you on because of your last article with TechCrunch. But before we get to that, since our last conversation, what have you been up to? Oh, so much. That was like a long time ago. That was almost like 10 years ago. Hmm. So since then, the main change in my life is that I had a baby and she's actually seven years old now. So so yeah, it's been quite a while. And then I spent another seven years working at TechCrunch and then I got laid off. So <laughs> a quick summary of my like life in the past 10 years. Yeah, I'm very sorry to hear about you being laid off by TechCrunch recently. And also you have been very active on Twitter before their last article. I guess my question is, what's the experience like when suddenly engaging many people online will come to you and being helpful and et cetera? I was really shocked, to be honest, because I didn't know that that many people read my articles or that it had such an impact. So when all these people came and told me, I was so overwhelmed, they started shaking. My husband told me I was shaking because I was just like, wow, I had no idea. Because um, the thing is, I published overnight US time and most of our readers are in the US. I knew people read my work, of course, but I didn't know that many people would come out and offer help or give me even job offers. So so it really just caught me off guard. I think, and another one of the reasons I think is because I was part of the first wave of writers. Well, I hope there isn't a second wave, but I was part of the first wave of writers to be laid off from TechCrunch. And because TechCrunch hadn't had layoffs of that scale before, we definitely got a lot of attention. So the way I described it, it was like going to my own funeral, suddenly hear all the really nice things people have to say about you. So I'm really grateful because I really wasn't expecting that at all. Well, I have been reading your coverage for the last 12 years too. So a lot of us out there, probably if for anybody who works in Asia tech, we have probably read your articles one way or another because you cover most of the tech ecosystem here for for the American audience. So I think when that news break, that's probably why everybody was a a bit shocked and who is going to represent us. There are other tech crunch writers in the region as well, but you're probably one of the most tenured and most well-known to at least most of the people there, even people in Singapore too. Yeah, I figure I've been around 12 years, so I've become constant in people's lives who follow like Asia tech news, especially Southeast Asia. So I got the feeling that when I was when I was laid off, people were like, what happened? She's been around for 12 years. Yeah. So, so I want to know what are your plans from now on then after this? Well, I'm starting in April as director of content and uh, content and media at PR Group. They're a public relations firm. They work with growth stage startups, and they've also worked with bigger companies like Dropbox, PayPal, and Etsy, wow. which I think is a really cool mix. And I'll also be leading the expansion of their Asia business because they're based in Australia and Singapore, and they want to grow more in Asia. So that's one of the things I'll be focusing on. Mm, so you're actually going to go into the 
PR space, so it would be on the other side. <laughs> and yeah, in. exactly. On the other side, I was really eager. Honestly, I've known I was going to be a journalist since I was 13 years old. It was always just, I'm going to be a journalist because I write well, but I can't write fiction. So what, what else can I do with my like skills? So from the time I was really young, I always knew I was going to be a journalist. And that's exactly what I've been doing since I was in my really early 20s. So I'm 42 now. So I was thinking, okay, after I was laid off, I was thinking, do I want to pursue another journalism position or do I want to work in another industry? And I realized I really want to work in another industry mm. just well, for a for, new challenge. So 42, the answer to the ultimate question, if you read okay. Douglas Adams, of course. <laughs> I'm pretty much the one important question that I always ask my guests. And I think this is a good time to actually ask you again, given your career journey, what are the interesting lessons you can share with my audience? For me, I think it's really striking I uh, because Half of my career was at TechCrunch, more than half, actually. And there are pluses and minuses to working at the same job for 12 years. The plus is that you get to watch a place grow and evolve. TechCrunch is, right now is not the TechCrunch I knew a decade ago. So that was really fascinating to watch it, watch the event space grow, watch them bring on new writers, watch their business objectives change and editorial objectives change. And also personally, I got really good at what I did. And I also had a sense of stability. But the minus is that that stability can turn to becoming too comfortable. And being too comfortable means you no longer have that spark that galvanized you at the beginning of your career, which is one of the reasons why I wanted a career change, even though PR is pretty journalism adjacent, is so much enough of a change for me to hopefully have that spark I had in my early 20s. Mm. So that's a very good point making that change. And I definitely wish you all the best in making that change oh, thank you. moving forward. But today I want to talk to you about that final article that you wrote for TechCrunch yeah, called yeah. Don't Ignore Asia Tech. And actually I was really looking for a very interesting guest for this episode 450 because it's almost reaching my 500. Yeah, yeah. So I, I thought this is that's amazing yeah. number. Yeah, this is really something I think is very important to look back yeah. at the past, I guess. So what is the inspiration behind this final article on TechCrunch? Well, basically, it's TechCrunch is refocusing on Silicon Valley, which is one of the reasons why I was laid off in the first place. And OK, I wasn't just to be clear, I wasn't bitter about the layoff because I after 12 years, I also felt like it was time for me to go. But this is my way of saying that I think they are making a mistake by not not focusing on international markets as much. Um, because TechCrunch, for a couple of reasons, TechCrunch still has a lot of clout in markets outside of the US. And also the, the second more important one is that Asia is obviously a very important place to keep an eye on in terms of tech. You can't cover tech well without covering Asia at some point. And in terms of the article, I also wanted to work with my Asia teammates, Rita Lau, Kate Park, Manish Singh, and Jagmeet Singh. I want to work with with to basically make the put the article together and have it be a collaborative project. So I feel like they really deserve a lot of credit. And also just for vanity purposes, it's going to be on top of my like author page forever. So I wanted to make sure it was a good article. Hmm. So over the 12 years at TechCrunch, because you cover such a wide, diverse set of subjects on tech in the yeah. region, how have you seen the Western perceptions of Asia tech companies change? Well, I think it's changed a lot because when I started, I was constantly annoyed by people who acted like companies in China were copying, in China, for example, were copying their counterparts in the US, basically, for example, like Alibaba was the Amazon of China, Baidu was the Google of China. And I actually use those phrases in my writing, which is really embarrassing now. But that was like the easiest way of trying to getting people to understand what exactly they did. But I think in terms of perceptions, I think they have changed a lot, especially with regards to China. Now Chinese companies are seen as innovators in their own right. And they have a lot of trends in Chinese and a lot of things produced by Chinese tech companies have influenced the West or are making a really big splash in Western markets. For example, the ones that I could think of at the top of my head is ByteDance and TikTok and also Ping Duoduo and T. Those are two apps that are taking off, especially in the US. 
And I think 10 or 12 years ago, people wouldn't have been able to imagine that. App developed by a Chinese company gaining the kind of traction that TikTok has in the U.S. Mm. And I think I will just add Shein also to the mix as well. Oh, yes, yeah, three companies Shein, yeah. Is, is, are really taking the world by their brands. Yeah, and, Shein, and people don't even realize that they are Chinese companies even. So what were the some of the common misperceptions about Asian tech that you encountered and now you are sought to correct in the way you write about them then? When I wrote about it, I was like, in addition to assuming that all Asia tech companies, particularly in China, were copycats of Western companies, I think there are also a lot of misperceptions about how easy it is to enter a market, especially when they're in an Asian market, especially when there are incumbent players already. Um, for example, like Uber failed. They failed. I think it's fair to say, they, yeah, basically they failed. That's a harsh word, but they failed in both China and Southeast Asia, where they were acquired by DD in China and Grab in Southeast Asia. And then Facebook really fell flat on its face in a lot of markets with free basics because it undermined net neutrality and also assumed that consumers, like just because maybe they had to be price conscious, they were willing to access only a handful of sites as opposed to having access to a free internet. And I think people also, they underestimate the influence that Asia has had in other parts of the world. For example, in China, that includes social e-commerce or people selling through streaming video. That's really popular. Maybe not as much in the U.S., but definitely it's taken off in Southeast Asia, I believe. And also short videos as a form of entertainment, which is you see them now in Facebook, Instagram, and Oh, YouTube. It's complete. It's completely redefined, redefined the way people consume video content. And I guess then from there on, how did your perspectives about Asian markets evolve, especially from where you're located in Asia? Okay, so I'm based in Taipei. And for a long time, for several years, at least, I was the only person on the site for hours at a time, which meant that I had a lot of opportunities to screw things up. Fortunately, I didn't. But the thing is, like, being based in Taipei is that it's always interesting when people say they have a correspondent covering Asia tech, because I'm like, you do understand Asia is a very big place, don't you? Different countries, within each country, there's different demographics. It's just bizarre to me that people are like, Asia. Even when I was writing the headline, don't ignore Asia tech, I was just like, God, Asia tech. But so just covering Asia being the only person covering Asia, I was I had my own short sightedness too. For example, like when it came to, even though I'm Taiwan's right next to China, there was a lot of ch things about China tech that I didn't understand because I wasn't there on the ground. And when it came to India, I was definitely ill-equipped to cover India because it's such a spe specific market. I think you really have to have people on the ground to cover it. So one of the um, things, one example I could think of, and I mentioned this in my article, was after Microsoft bought Nokia's, or after they announced that Microsoft was buying Nokia's devices and services division, my immediate thought was that this was because Microsoft wanted to make more feature phones for markets like India. And then my editor came online and I showed, I sent my article for her for editing. And she was just like, sales of smartphones are taking at different price points are taking off all over the world. And I was just like, oops, I'm going to have to rewrite this entire thing. So yeah, I had to do that because I underestimated what customers in emerging markets like India wanted. I assumed they were still willing to settle for smartphone feature phones, where all you could do was like text people and play snakes or something when they're already demanding smartphones. So that was a uh, so that was 2013 already. So mm -hmm. it made no sense for me to be like, yeah, all these millions of people are still willing to settle for smartphones. You when when smart willing to settle for our feature phones when smartphones were already becoming increasingly available. Mm. But because you're based in Taiwan, you're also at the home of two very important companies. One is Foxconn and the other one is yeah. TSMC. Yeah. So do you actually spend time to really focus on those two 
companies that actually had quite a lot of impact to the rest of the world. One in basically giving everyone iPhones and the other one is giving everyone chips, which everybody is now Yeah, exactly. To. No, I actually focus on startups more than the semiconductor companies. Though I did write an uh, article about semiconductor companies in relation to how Lai Qingde would might potentially help them. The semiconductor industry already benefits from a lot of tax subsidies or tax cuts. And that was one of the things that when I was interviewing startup founders for another article that I wrote, that was one of the things that I think frustrated them was that the semiconductor companies here get so much tax cuts or reduced taxes that they actually pay less taxes as a whole <laughs> than startup companies do. And when some of the founders I talked to were like, why not us? But when I was writing my article about Lai Ching does uh, uh, potential policies for the semiconductor industry here, um, one of the things that an analyst brought up was that even though it is a massive industry, even though it's something that Taiwan is known for, it's not, most people here don't work in semiconductors and, and chips. Most people, so the thing is, they're going to look to Lai Ching to, like to work specifically on domestic issues. And if he gives too much to the semiconductor industry, that's going to frustrate them. And also in the semiconductor industry, it also you know, relies on a global supply chain and it hasn't always been very resilient. So it's interesting, it's interesting to see how TSMC and Foxconn are always going to are going to deal with that. If, for example, their factories, their new fabs in the US are going to help them become more, more resilient in that matter, in that way, manner. Mm, I would have to say that at least Taiwan produced the ninth most important company in the world, in the world, not in Asia. Yeah, TSMC. Now, TSMC. Yeah, yeah definitely. Of, what What is the one thing about Asia tech now, in, with China included, of course, that very few do? Okay, I don't know if, if this sounds very insightful, mm. but one thing I realized while reporting on a lot of different markets in Asia is just how important rural populations are. Because sometimes startups will focus on populations within urban areas. But the fact of the matter is rural populations, most of the people are probably located there and they will be driving growth for a lot of startups. It's That's one of the reasons why Ping Duoduo became so successful. It's user acquisition first focus on rural users, including farmers who provided, who provided a lot of the produce. So through the platform itself. And Ping Duoduo actually had a for program for farmers that included training and subsidies. And let me see. Let's see. In Southeast Asia, I the two startups I could think of off the top of my head that are also social commerce startups for rural um, areas are Super, which is building its own logistics infrastructure to get to rural areas. I think, especially in Jakarta, Jakarta because Jakarta has so many cities, they're spread out over islands. So logistics is really important. And Evermost, it's a startup that's focused on social commerce for halal products, which is also important because I think, okay, I might be wrong, but the majority of the population in Indonesia is Muslim, I believe. Yes. So, yeah, so in Southeast Asia, rural communities are also driving social commerce, partly because they can get lower prices by shopping that way, but because the logistics infrastructure in many areas is so patchy and social commerce startups can maintain their own delivery networks, either building their own or piecing together their own to make delivery more efficient. So yeah, I think that's one of the things that I figure mo a lot more people than me know that, but I think that's one of the things that kind of goes unnoticed by people because when they think of a consumer, they usually think of, they picture somebody in their 20s to 40s in an urban market. Yeah, I think that's a very good insight because there's a lot of agriculture communities within Asia that's yeah. actually required to be served and yet no one is watching with some of the startups that actually. No, yeah, yeah, them. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I, I want to switch gears and talk about like individual ecosystems within Asia, because I think Asia, like you said, is a very big encompassing word. There is China, there is India, yeah. Japan, Korea, and yeah. uh, Singapore, Indonesia, etc. I want to first start with China because that's yeah. the one that everybody thinks that if not equal or a little bit lagging behind innovation in US. How has China's tech scene shifted? I think just now at the start of the conversation, you talk about the early impressions of China is what people used to say, say see to see copy to China. And then now because of WeChat, people like Elon Musk are saying that I would like what X app to become a super app. And this concept of super app is beginning to 
take shape in the US, but I don't think it will ever happen. So what's your perspective on that? I think it's really interesting because when I first started reporting, like the big three companies were BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And now there are a lot of other companies that are rising up. The one I could think of off the top of my head is Pinduoduo, which is it's smaller than Alibaba, but it's still, it's still growing really quickly because they've um, innovated so much with their social commerce model. And also because they've expanded into the U.S. with Timu, which is, and Timu is taking off really quickly. Even my dad uses Timu and my dad is tech savvy, but he won't use an app until a lot of people are using it. He's not like an early adopter. So I figure if my dad is using Timu, then obviously it's hit the mainstream. It's become essential for a lot of people shopping. Yeah. And I also think it's really interesting how quickly things like digital payments were adopted in China, like how how fast they were. I forget when WeChat Pay was introduced, but by the time I was going there, I remember in 2019 when the last time I went to China, you, you couldn't get anywhere without WeChat Pay. The thing is I couldn't download it on my phone because I have the foreign overseas version of WeChat, which has which is really stripped down. So when I got in a taxi, you're expected to pay in a taxi with WeChat Pay. That's or maybe Alipay, but generally it's WeChat Pay. I got into a taxi. I didn't. I couldn't download the payment app on my phone. I WeChat Pay on my phone, and I had to count out the change to the driver. And you could see he was actually really annoyed at me, like extremely annoyed. So I was just like, "Oops, sorry." But it's just really amazing how WeChat has become part of daily life for people in China. I wonder if an app like that would have taken off as quickly in the U.S. For instance, if it would be if it would have become as integrated into daily life as WeChat is in daily life in China now. Mm -hmm. And in terms of social media, I think it's amazing how much TikTok has changed. It's also like the first app by a Chinese company to gain the kind of traction it has in the US. And it's amazing like how quickly it took off in terms of not only user numbers and but also becoming like a huge part of internet culture in the US. And also influencing how other social media apps look like YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. I think that's really amazing because I think I said earlier a few years ago, maybe even five years ago, it, that would have been un unimaginable for an app by a Chinese company to take over, to gain gain that kind of attention and that and that kind of um, traction in the U.S. Mm. TikTok was pretty interesting because they also acquired a Chinese company who was doing well in the U.S. called Musically to yeah, be able yeah, exactly. to do yeah. that, and they also yeah. have a in-house yeah. one in China specifically called Douyin on there. Yeah. If it comes to TikTok, I think they have a pretty big impact on social media. But I guess it also changes the game for Chinese tech companies. Can you talk about how their success in globally has actually also impacted all the rest of the Chinese companies that expands out of China into the international scene? Okay, well, TikTok had a huge effect on how people consume video. I personally don't like it, so I don't see its appeal. But my friends love it. They love watching short form videos. And to be sure, there were other apps before that focus on short form video in the US, including Vine. I don't know if anybody remembers that. I loved Vine, actually. Yeah. It shut down years and years ago. But people now are used to scrolling through tons of video that might last tons of video that might last only a few seconds instead of sitting down to watch a longer form video that might take minutes as opposed to seconds. And it's given rise to a whole host of TikTok influencers. And I read, a, I think it was a Pew Research report. Actually, I might be wrong about Pew Research mm. report. There was a report that is expected to overtake Facebook influencer spending this year. So I think that's really, I think that's really interesting. I think it's interesting for me as an observer, because I personally do not like TikTok. And I don't follow TikTok influencers at all. But I have a best friend who does, my best friend does, and it's really fascinating when she sends me this stuff because I'm like, okay, this is a whole new world for me. I don't know what that says about me. Maybe I'm just too old to get into TikTok. But in terms of other Chinese tech companies, I'm not sure how it's changing the game for Chinese tech companies internationally because as soon as TikTok became popular 
it instantly caught the attention of the U.S. government as a national security concern. <laughs> so there was that, remember, there was that whole fracas where Microsoft began discussions with TikTok to divest its U.S. operations from ByteDance. That was a that was a whole blast from the past that I, I almost forgot about because the whole like surrounding TikTok in the U.S. government, there were so many hap- things things happening that Reed and I actually wrote a timeline about it. But the thing was, it was nearly banned by the U.S. government because part of it was because they're like, well, we don't know where user data is stored. Does ByteDance in China have access to it? Are your U.S. operations really that are really are, are they really that separated from China operations? There was that whole thing. So mm. I don't know. I don't know how what that would will mean for apps like Timu or Shin. I don't know how what I don't know how what it will mean for other apps that potentially want to enter. Um, Mm-hmm. Other Chinese apps that want to enter you, the U.S., but yeah, 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 and and also because just to like between us, to, I think now the U.S. government is now planning to come up with legislation to ask by dance to divest out TikTok, so that whole Microsoft conversation you talk about that's deja yeah, vu yes. is coming back in again. But this time, I think there is much more stronger ground of trying to do that as such and of course there's always this whole ban thing that is always on the top of their heads and i really wondered was what is the whole point of doing it if you don't if you can't show any evidence of any things that has been done wrong at the moment yeah. at least from the observer from the outside looking yeah it's just really <laughs> weird to me and it's also it just seems i okay i'm not well versed in like mm. us like data privacy regulations and laws in my opinion okay well if the us can ban one app social media app well what about the other apps because i don't think any of them are great with regards to user privacy none of them strike me as like trust totally trustworthy so I, I was just thinking about that. And also another thing I think about is how my friends who are addicted to TikTok, how, how are they going to survive if it gets banned? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. So sad. Uh, let, let's, take, let's take a simpler tone down from away from TikTok for a while. I think WeChat's super app have definitely caught a lot yeah. of eye of entrepreneurs in the West. And of course, now there are attempts to replicate it in the US. I, I guess what are the lessons can be learned from WeChat's success with the super app? I think basically Mark Zuckerberg said, and I think it was 2019, that he wants to turn Facebook into a super app with things like you could like calls, video chats, groups, stories, businesses, payments, commerce, and other services. But I don't think it's like quite come to fruition because when I look at Facebook, it doesn't have, I can't make payments through it. I can't shop through it unless it's like some sort of group buy, sell by still trade group. So I think his vision for creating, turning super app, turning Facebook into a super app, it hasn't quite come to fruition. But let me see. But in India, Meta did add grocery ordering services to WhatsApp. So I think they're maybe gradually working towards turning it into a super app. But I think the app that's probably closest to becoming a super app in the West is Snapchat, because it lets people do things like play games together and book movie tickets. Let's see. I, I think one thing, one thing that I've read that is standing in the way of more companies, more of the big tech companies turning their apps into super apps is um, regulators concern with consolidating power within such a few, such a small number of apps. And also, in, and I think in Western markets, people already use, are used to having multiple apps for, for different, each with each with its own reason. Mm. What are your thoughts on how the Chinese tech ecosystem being caught flat-footed by ChatGPT from OpenAI and now ended up playing the catching up game? I think it's interesting. I think Baidu, I understand that Baidu is a top company innovating in AI in China. They recently announced Ernie 4.0, which it claims is as good as GPT-4. And it's also one of the only uh, firms to get government approval to release AI products to the public. And so China now has, let's see, 130 language models or about 40% of the global total, but it's still behind, let's see, it's still behind the United States in terms of the large language models it has. So I think that's going to be interesting to see how it develops in the future, just because I don't know a lot about AI, but I assume open AI chat GBT would be harder to use in China because of the language differences. Mm. And of course, there's the, the Chinese AI companies are all using open source. For example, yeah. Li Kai-Fu's uh, 01.ai that's using yeah. Lama yeah. 2 to retrain as such. 
Yeah. My last question on China, there is a big shift in venture capital. And in fact, with a lot of US venture capital firms leaving China, I think the best known is Sequoia, splitting yeah. up the Sequoia China into Hongshan. How do you see the future of Chinese startups and whether they can still be able to grow out of homegrown to be exported to the rest of the world, like your Ali, Baba, today with the cloud, maybe with Timo, Xi'an or TikTok? Yes, yeah, I think if it's hard for them to raise money, that's a true and that's true in all markets across the world. Is that it's just really hard to raise money right now. It's hard for venture capitalists to raise money from LPs. It's hard for startups to raise money from venture capitalists. It's just really hard. But I think in China, if it's hard for them to raise money, that it's going to be hard for startups to achieve the scale up by dance or other equally influential tech companies. And U.S. investors had already started to draw back from China even before Biden signed his executive order barring U.S. investment in AI, quantum computing, and semiconductors. It was actually, I think, I was looking, I was doing research, and Crunchbase says 2023 was on pace to mark the slowest in U.S. venture capital investment in China in at least five years. So it's definitely, it's the rate of investment has definitely been dropping down even before the executive order. On the other hand, Crunchbase did report that China-based investors may exceed deal totals from last year. So, mm. so that's pretty interesting. The shift is happening for a couple of reasons. The first is that investors are now generally bearish. And that's that's the same for other markets, as I, as I mentioned before. At the same time, less in- international investors are showing interest because of issues like China's tech crackdowns, including when Ant, Ant Group's IPO was called off in a data scrutiny probe into DD, which, which was just crazy at that time. China's also making it harder for overseas IPOs which makes investing in Chinese startups less attractive to investors because they can't see a clear exit strategy. So China investors are still putting money into things outside the ban, but less than they used to because of changing regulations on geopolitical issues and a slowing economy. And a lot of Chinese VCs are also going to the US, but PitchBook predicts that VC activity with with U.S. participation in China, will hit a decade decade low this year. So let's see some possibilities for let's see. One possibility is that Chinese China's U.S. dollar fund managers might go to the Middle East. I think I'm not quite. Mm. Clear. That's that's a possible path because that's where the new LPs are. So I think a lot even for West for U.S. investors are actually go going to Middle East to actually raise money as well on that. Yeah. Yeah, and also um, Japan might be like a new market for Chinese SaaS startups that need to expand outside mm-hmm. of China, which is interesting. But yeah, I've yeah, I've, I've and I've also read like one of my colleagues, Alex Will, well, one of my ex colleagues, Alex Wilhelm, mm-hmm. wrote about helping Dodo having a strong IPO is a good might be a good sign for Chinese startups because the big Chinese tech companies have historically been pretty strong investors in startups that are coming up. Mm. Well, I think China is still going to be pretty unknown in the next decade and I don't know where we are going with that. Maybe I will switch gears a little bit and maybe I'll go straight to talking about the India tech ecosystem, but only specifically how it has evolved and is it just going to be like at the stage of where China is 20 years ago, specifically things like smartphones as well, they are still in the manufacturing phase. What were your thoughts on the Indian market then? I think it's really interesting because I think people outside of India tend to make the mistake that I used to, which was that they assume that consumers there are really price conscious to the point where they're willing to forego things like that other people, people in other countries have. But that's been changing for a long time. One of the articles I linked to in my article was by um, Manish, who covers mm-hmm. India for TechCrunch. And was he wrote and he wrote about how Indian consumers are they're now demanding goods, luxury goods basically. And that includes smartphones. And it's also another interesting thing about India right now. It's becoming a hub for top smartphone companies. And that's 
thanks in part to initiatives by the U.S., not U.S., by the Indian government to just make it attractive to mm. smart phone makers to come in. Yeah, and I think part of that is because they want to diversify their manufacturing from being primarily based in China and make sure that they actually have another place where it's being being manufactured just so they aren't putting all their eggs in one basket. But India's role as a manufacturing hub is still is still developing because one of the things Manish mentioned to me was that 10 years ago nobody could imagine that India would become a top smartphone manufacturing hub that that factories there would be making smartphones for you know Apple, Samsung and Google the top smartphone makers. But but so that's really interesting to watch it develop and to keep an eye on it. Mm. And I think recently they had a lot of startup unicorns getting into trouble like Baidu and even Paytm as well. Uh, yeah. But it's still a market to watch. I want yeah. to go into South Korea because one, one of the things I've seen about the smartphone market in India is the Reliance, which is a very well, very big, well-known big conglomerate. That's almost of the size of a Shaboy like in South Korea. So I think how is... South Korea's startup ecosystem developing, especially also with the influence of Share Boys. Uh, great example, Samsung <laughs> and government support. Well, what I okay, so at the beginning of my career at TechCrunch, I took a trip there actually to moderate at one of the Spark Lab events. And it was still like South Korea's startup ecosystem was still fledgling. It was still pretty small, I would say. And the country's tech market was tech ecosystem was de definitely dominated by Chebols. But over the years, Korea's startup ecosystem has grown a lot. That's thanks in part to support from government agencies that have pledged basically billions of dollars in funding to startups, which means that the amount of unicorns, the number of unicorns in, in Korea shot really shot up between 2017 and 2022. It increased a lot. I don't want to give specific numbers just in case I'm mm. wrong. It was mm. definitely like a lot. One of the ways that South Korea's troubles are helping is that a lot of them have corporate venture arms. So you have LG Technology Ventures and Hyundai's Strategic Investment Arm, and then Samsung Catalyst Fund, which helps, which definitely helps startups a lot. One of the things I talked. I actually wrote another an article on Taiwan's startup ecosystem. And one of the things I heard a lot from venture capitalists is that they really want the startup ecosystem here to emulate the startup ecosystem in Korea with that type of government support and with those kind of corporate venture capital, corporate venture arms. Mm. So if I were to think of the replicating the same kind of infrastructure support for startups in South Korea, similar than what they're trying to do in Taiwan then? Yeah, that's what uh, founders and members of the ecosystem. Mm. There are definitely funding. The government does provide funding, but I think what startup founders here want is that they want funding because it's really hard to get funding once you hit B or Series B or Series C. So they want to see the government pledge pledge more funding to startups that are growth stage, or mm. for example, startups that are in deep tech. Those are those are um, technologies that take a long time to develop and come to market. So they mm. need to stay long to support. So yeah, so one of the things I've heard from, from a lot of people in Taiwan's tech ecosystem is that the kind of government support seen in 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 Korea, the type of covert venture arms, it would it would be really great to have that come be seen in Taiwan too. Mm. So I'm gonna switch gears from Taiwan, Korea down to where I live, which is the Southeast Asia region. Okay. One that there has been a pretty interesting conversation going around because of this whole drying up of funding and a lot of founders uh, have difficulty in fundraising as well. And now I think that's beginning to, people are beginning to say, is that really a Southeast Asia story? But I'm not going to look forward. Instead, I'm going to look back. Um, yeah. How have you seen the Southeast Asia tech ecosystems growth and global impact? What are your thoughts on that? I think South uh, East Asia's tech ecosystem has grown tremendously since I started covering it in 2012. And I think the inflection point that I remember is when Grab acquired Uber Southeast Asia business in 2018. I think the reaction from a lot of people in outside of Southeast Asia, especially in the West, was like, wow, a local incumbent from Southeast Asia actually acquired Uber's 
business, there was a surprise. And that's when people start to pay closer attention to Southeast Asia. And it also, I remember the the tech ecosystem in Southeast Asia, oh, just again, just like one of the one of the places where I feel ridiculous being like Southeast Asia, because yeah. it's, obviously there's so many markets and they're all very different and complicated in their own way. But just for just so I don't have to like name all of them out, mm. like, you know, I'll just see, say Southeast Asia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it grew a massive amount during the funding boom of 2020 and 2021, 2022. Um, it was basically part of it was because a lot of apps or services that were developed during the, the pandemic kind of got to the point where they could seek funding. And I also noticed there were a ton of investment apps that got attention, like Pingdu, Bibet, Ajib. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, that's Long, right. Sa Safe. And mm. then SME focused fintech startups, Bukurarung, Bukakas, mm. Gadjigesa, and Wagely. And then social commerce startups and e-commerce aggregators, they all got funding during that time. So that was very intense. And then in terms of their global impact, there are two startups I can think of off the top of my head that are expanding internationally. First with Australia, these are Homage, and it's an app for matching caretakers with patients. And, mm. oh, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing this correctly, Buka Lapa. La huh? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're pronounced. Yeah, they're they're also expanding in uh, Southeast Asia. One area where I personally think I might be totally wrong on this, but I personally think South. One area where I think that Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia startups can have a global impact is the work that they are doing, the technology that they are developing to serve unbanked or underbanked customers, which is people who don't really have access to traditional financial services. These include one that's raised a lot of funding is Credivo. Yeah, they have instant credit financing for e-commerce and offline purchases and personal loans. And a lot of the startups that are working with unbanked or underbanked customers, since these people, these consumers usually don't have access to traditional credit scores, they develop their own ways to gauge credit worthiness. For example, they might look at data sources, including telcos, e-commerce accounts, and bank accounts, and just put them through an algorithm and use that to decide if they're credit worthy. So I was thinking, I'm sure in other ecosystems and other countries, there are also startups looking to solve the same problem. But I think just the amount of work that's been done on, on serving unbanked or underbanked customers in Southeast Asia, I think that could have a global impact. Mm. Given that all you have covered Asia and you also have your ex-colleagues who are still covering Asia as such, what advice would you give to journalists or analysts who's looking at this Asia's fast, dynamic, and diverse tech landscape? Oh, yeah. I think my first bit of advice would be to go into things with an open mind and be prepared to be surprised and to have your perceptions challenged because that's what happened when I first started covering Asia tech. For example, like one thing I could think of is definitely when Grab was, when Grab at the beginning, when it first started in 2013 or so, I could see that it was becoming a force in Southeast Asia and building its own super app model. But I personally had no idea that it, it would like outrun Uber in their, com in, their comp in their competition within five years. And the same went when Didi acquired Uber in China. I was caught off guard by that. And then TikTok, just the rise of TikTok, that really blew me away. Um, so even though I'm a tech, even though I've been writing about tech for a long time, all those things still shocked me. Well, mm. okay, not shocked necessarily, but all those things still surprised me. I was like, wow. But it was exciting to watch because these are all Asian tech companies. Yeah, it's to So yeah, that's why I say to go into it with an open mind because you never know what you might be caught off guard by. You never know if you're writing about a startup that's just getting its Series A funding. Maybe it's going to be the next grab. Mm. Maybe Maybe it's going to be the next grab or the next ping door door. And yeah, so that's that's one thing I would recommend. Just explore all possibilities with the company, especially yeah. if you think they have a good founding team and especially if they're filling a real gap in the market. Mm. So my traditional closing question, what does great look like for Asia Tech in the next decade from your perspective? I think what I hope for, what my, my wish is, I don't want people to see Asia Tech I don't want them to ignore it, which is which is why I titled my article that don't ignore it, 
because that's that's just that's just not that's just not a smart idea. If you cover tech, you have to pay attention to Asia tech. And I also don't want Asia tech to be seen as a novelty. I think we've moved far past that point um, of Asia tech as Asia tech being like, oh, one of the things I liked about TikTok taking off in the US was that people didn't refer to it as a Chinese app. They referred to it, it was just a social media app to them. It wasn't like, oh, look at this Chinese app that's still really getting a lot of attention. You know, not that it's bad to call it a Chinese app, but they they saw it on its own terms, which really pleased me. I'm and it's also I'm really happy to see things like Asia's influence us on social media around the world, on fintech around the world, India becoming a manufacturing hub for smartphones, and also Asian companies acquiring Western ones. That also is very exciting. That's that's also as somebody who reports reports on Asia or who reported on Asia, that's really excited to see Asia companies get to the point where they could buy. I'm trying to remember what it was that Copang. Mm, Copang is this of Korean. Okay. Yeah, did they buy Farfetch? I don't know, but we can check. And if there is, I'll put it in the show notes. Okay, yeah. yeah. Or I can look mm. it out, actually. <laughs> yeah, actually, they, they did buy Farfetch. Okay, yeah, they did. That's why it slipped my mind. But I'm always like, there's part of me that when that kind of news comes out, I'm like, yay, because it just forces people to pay attention to companies in this part of the world. It forces people in the West to pay attention to companies in this world and the power that they've they've amassed over the past few years and how quickly they've grown. So yeah, it's definitely, it's very gratifying to me. Mm. Patrick, many thanks for coming on the show and really share your reflections on covering Asia Tech. And of course, good luck to your next journey. My two other closing questions is any recommendations that has recently inspired you? I think in terms of recommendations, I would definitely say to continue following the work of the other TechCrunch Asia writers. There's Rita Lau, Kate Park, Jamik, Jagmeet Sin, and Manish Sin. I, I, yeah, I would definitely continue reading their work. Yeah, let's see. In terms of other recommendations right now, I don't have any right now. I, I can help you with one. I would just highly recommend everyone to watch Shogun by oh, FX Shogun. series. Oh, yes. yeah, Shogun. And actually, actually this is, yeah. I've read the novel many years back and seen an earlier version, which is not really as good as this one because they really put Japanese actors speaking Japanese. I think one of the things that Netflix has actually changed the way how we think about shows, you don't have to do it in English. You can just do it in the native language with the translation and bring in the English speaker as it is. I thought that was one of the most refreshing thing I like about this show. Oh, I do actually have a recommendation. Oh, go for it. How to Do Nothing. Yeah, I need, uh, let me just look it up. It's by Jenny O'Dell. The full title is How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy. Mm. And I've it's been like a year or so since I read it. But I remember it was so refreshing because the thing is I'm const- I'm a working mom. So when I'm not working, busy with work, I'm busy taking care of my daughter and I, and I'm, or I'm busy doing chores. Not very well, but I do try. And reading that was really eye-opening to me because the thing is like, oh, also when I'm not busy doing any of those things, I'm always on my smartphone. So one of that was a book I really appreciated in terms of just how to stay still, in terms of opening my eyes to how so many things in, in culture, so many cult- things in culture, and including including apps in the internet in general, are made to just take your attention from things that might be better worth better worth your time mm-hmm. and in terms of in terms of shows this is a little bit er- early or er- this is a little bit older but they are coming out with a new season hopefully hopefully sooner rather than later but warriors i don't um, know if you watched it not yet but it's on my list to watch if i have to die it is so good i love that show so much it's it was it's it's basically about San Francisco in the late 1800s, I would say 1880s, 1890s, yeah. when Chinese immigrants weren't treated very well at all. And it's about triads having their own, they're having their own clash, they're having their own like war. These two triads are having their own war. But at the same time, there's the larger influence of racism against them in, in Chinatown and in, in San Francisco. And the acting, I just thought was so good. And I think there's so many things 
that are still relevant today. And it's also just a very watchable show. Mm. So where can my audience find you then? Oh, you can find me at, at Catherine Shu at Twitter. No, it's okay, not Twitter, X. I still call it, I <laughs> formerly don't... known as Twitter. <laughs> yeah, X formerly known as Twitter. I'm at Catherine Shu there. And also LinkedIn. You can find me at LinkedIn. I'm Catherine Shu. I don't know if that's my handle. I can't remember. Catherine Shu, but yeah, you can find me yes. there. Too. Okay. So many thanks on coming to the show. You can definitely find us on YouTube and Spotify and all podcast platforms and also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. So Catherine, many thanks for coming on the show and I look forward to speak to you soon. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Take care.